I really feel like I've embraced midlife and I'm feeling better now than I did even in my 40s. And I'm not just talking about the physical aspects. I'm also reflecting on the increased confidence and overall life satisfaction that comes with midlife and maturity. When it comes to our skin, the past can catch up to us, as well as the changes in hormones and the loss of collagen and increased dryness. There's so much information out there in regard to serums and creams and procedures, but it's up to us individually as to what path you choose, if any at all. Here's my stance on this. Dermatologic and cosmetic procedures have the ability to give us a little lift of confidence and to address those nagging things that we may see in the mirror each morning, or in my case, it's in the natural light in my car. I support women on both sides of the fence, those who choose to embrace their skin as is, or those who decide they want to explore their skincare options. At the end of the day, I hope that whichever path we choose, we do it for us and for no one else. My next guest is a very accomplished dermatologist who wants skincare and dermatologic procedures to be provided in a warm, caring, and well-informed environment catering to the individual needs of her patients. Health, wellness, career, family, life, and the better side of 50. I'm your host, Michelle Follin, and this is Asking for a Friend. Hello, listeners. Today's guest expert is Dr. Mona Foad. She is the founder and CEO of Mona Dermatology in Cincinnati, Ohio, and has been practicing dermatology for 20 years. She attended Johns Hopkins for her undergrad degree, as well as her master's in epidemiology. She is a proud graduate of the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, go Bearcats, and finished her residency in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Hospital Center. She is a member of the American Academy of Dermatology, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, and the American Society of Cosmetic Dermatology and Aesthetic Surgery. Very impressive. It's really nice to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm oh. so excited to go over all these fun topics with you. Oh my gosh. So I was out with my high school friends last night and I told them that I was going to be speaking to you today. And the list of questions, I already got a ton of questions from my listeners and then my group of friends. So this is going to be lively. <laughs> I'm really excited. So is it all right if I call you Mona? Absolutely. Okay. Tell us just a little bit more about yourself so the listeners can get to know you a bit. Sure. So I grew up in Cincinnati. So I am a native of Cincinnati. I, as you you know, I went away, came back, went away, and I'm back. I come from a family of physicians. My mom and dad are actually physicians. My dad is still practicing. I have two brothers. I have one who's in town, Mohab Fouad. He's a hand surgeon. And I have another brother who lives in San Diego. And I think he's the smartest one of us because he's <laughs> got great weather year round. And he's actually a professor of economics. And I have two amazing, wonderful daughters they are 17 and 19, and they are very strong, independent young ladies, and I'm very proud of them because I think it's important for women to be strong, and it doesn't always help me, <laughs> yeah. but I'm really proud of them. So very happy, very, very, very fortunate. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I have two daughters as well. 25 and 27. So I'm right there with you. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. fun. It can be challenging, but it's great. And as yeah. they get older, they're much easier. Yeah, I promise. Oh, no, they're, they're good. <laughs> I'm very, very lucky. That's great. I thought it was interesting when I was looking at your background that you were actually an art history major as your undergrad. When did the topic of medicine come up and pursuing that? 
coming from a family of physicians, I thought I was going to go into medicine. And I went to college and I ended up loving art history. And I graduated with a degree in art history. And I actually was working at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Art in Washington, cool. D.C. Oh, it's really cool. It was there that I realized that although I loved art, I felt like I wasn't really touching people. So I then decided that I actually wanted to really go into medicine. I ended up going and doing a degree in public health in epidemiology and then went to medical school. I really feel that dermatology, especially what I do, I'm able to combine the aesthetics of art history with the aesthetics of what I do on a daily basis. So yeah. I feel really lucky that both of those things help to dovetail. And at the same time, my love of art, if you ever come to our office, you see that part of our space has a lot of art. We're a very proud sponsor of the Cincinnati Ballet. Yeah. I yeah. Love it. I love that. I think that's wonderful. And just for the listeners, this is the first time I've done an in-person interview and I got a tour after hours, after patient hours. I can only imagine how busy this place is when you have patients here. It's absolutely beautiful. And I think just being in this environment can be just incredibly pleasing for a patient that's coming in. So kudos to you for really having just a really wonderful atmosphere here. Thank you. Well, yeah. to be honest, we just did a remodel and one of our goals was to create a space where patients felt comfortable and they weren't scared because I think that you're always a little nervous going to the doctor and you don't have to be. I think it's important to have music and to have little things that make you feel like you can be a little bit more relaxed. So that was our goal. So I'm glad that you felt that. Yeah, I absolutely did. It's lovely, actually. You. you started Mona Dermatology with something in mind, and I can tell just walking in. What else was top of mind for you when you started your practice? So when I moved back to Cincinnati, I actually was working in Anderson, and I was working for Lee J. Vesper. He is a wonderful, wonderful mentor. I really enjoyed working with him, but it wasn't close to where I was living or where my parents were, and I had an opportunity to actually move and open my own practice and share the building actually with both my parents. So it was a no-brainer for me. One of the things when I opened this practice back in 2007 was I wanted to be able to address the whole patient and not just the medical dermatology patient. Because what I found was in Cincinnati in general, especially at that time, if you wanted to do anything aesthetic, it was all done by plastic surgeons. And then the rest of the United States, dermatologists do a lot of that. So I wanted to be able to open a practice that could address not just, for example, if you have acne, not just the medications that you might use, but I wanted to be able to talk about their skincare routine and did they need facials? Did they need peels? Do they have acne scarring that we need to address? And I wanted to be able to incorporate all of that under one roof. So we started small, obviously, and I had one esthetician. I had one other nurse practitioner working with me, just slow and steady as the turtle. We just kept growing and kept moving our path along. When I started, the focus was to be able to address the whole patient. Now I feel like we have a very successful, happy practice. And again, that's our goal. We will always address the whole patient. So people will ask me, well, are you ever going to give up the medical side? And frankly, no because that is part of the patient. I right. want to be able to, for example, there's many times we'll be doing a procedure, whether it's Botox or filler or something else, and we'll see a funny mole. Well, guess what? We should biopsy that. I don't want to send you somewhere else. We should be able to take care of that. Or actually one of our cosmetic nurse providers diagnosed melanoma while she was doing laser hair. So I think to be able to have people that understand both the medical side as well as the aesthetic side, it really sets us apart. Yeah. And I like the idea of being able to have one doctor for all my skin needs. Yeah. I love that. I told you I got a lot of questions from listeners and a lot from my friends too. I thought just the basics because it's really confusing. We go to the store, we're online, we're on Instagram or Facebook and there's a plethora of skin creams that are promising the world. Let's add serums onto that as well. When you're considering women in midlife, what is the one thing every woman 
should be using on their skin daily? I would have to say a sunscreen. Okay. I knew she was going to say that. Yeah. (laughs) I think that, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, I walk into Sephora sometimes with my girls and I myself am overwhelmed. And I think you go into Walgreens or CVS or even the department store and you're right. There's so, so many products. A lot of products can do something. I think the question is, to your point, what are you really looking for? Mm -hmm. Right? I always break it down into what I call the grass and the grass stands for growth factors. That's your G R is retinoids. A is antioxidants. S is sunscreen. And the other S is specialty products. If you'll notice, I didn't really throw moisturizers and cleansers in there because frankly, I think if you like your moisturizer or cleanser, okay. I think you just have to find one that fits your skin type. Now, if you tell me you're washing your face with eye or spring, I might, I might direct you towards something else. <laughs> and I have had people say that. <laughs> and it hurts me deeply. It smells good. It does smell good, but not for your face. Yeah. But I think in general, I think if you want to save a little bit of money, I think a lot of cleansers and moisturizers, they're great, but you don't have to spend, I don't think, a lot of money on them. I would put my money in something that actually does something more at the cellular level. Okay. Sunscreen. Mm -hmm. There has been, and that was one of the questions, there's been a lot about the safety of sunscreens out Mm -hmm. there. Is there one that you recommend to your patients? I always look at the ingredients of a sunscreen and the FDA did go back a while ago and they changed the wording on sunscreens and they want things to be broad spectrum, UVA, UVB. What that really means is you want to make sure that you have a sunscreen that's actually covering both your UVA rays, which we call our aging rays, and our UVB rays, which are what we call our burning rays, right? So you might not necessarily get a sunburn from your UVA rays, Mm -hmm. but you will get more damage because they tend to go deeper, Okay, right? And so when I look for a sunscreen, I'm actually looking at the ingredients. I always look for zinc oxide in my sunscreen because it can cover both UVA and UVB the best. A lot of the fear over safety of sunscreens also has to do with the chemical components of a sunscreen. There's a lot of chemical sunscreens that will cover UVB and they don't really go into the UVA range. Zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are what we call physical sunscreens, so they really don't tend to create a lot of problems like when people put them on the skin. Okay. Because I know some of the zinc oxides tend to be a little hard to rub in. So if you're wearing it on a daily basis, you kind of get that white haze on your face. Are there some out there that don't tend to do that? Right. So absolutely. So let's say you again go to Walgreens, not to pick on Walgreens, but let's say you go to Walgreens and you pick up a zinc oxide. It's more of the baby sunscreen and you're right. They're really white and pasty. You want to find a cosmetically elegant sunscreen. Some of my favorites are Elta MD. That's a fantastic sunscreen. It's very lightweight. You don't have that white sheen that you're talking about. Yes. And the zinc percentages can be from 9 to 12%. Color Science is another brand that makes wonderful sunscreens and actually Everscreens. They also help protect you against things like blue light and infrared. Oh, Skin Medica makes a really good sunscreen and Elastin has a really good sunscreen. So you may spend a little bit more on a cosmetically elegant sunscreen, but it's actually one that you'll use. And so a lot of times when people ask me, they're like, what do you like? I'm like, well, number one, I want to make sure it's something you'll use. So I can tell you all these things, but Mm -hmm. let's find one that actually you put on and you go, oh, I like that. Right. The other thing is there's a lot of nice tinted sunscreens that somehow magically tend to fit everybody's skin type. Tinted sunscreens are nice because they have iron oxides that also help protect your skin from things like infrared. And if you have melasma, they're really good for melasma patients. Okay. All right. I have a friend that has melasma, so I'll I'll let her know that because I know she's always looking for options for that. Yeah. Okay. That's that's really great. Daily sunscreen wearing, if you're going to be out, face, neck, hands? Well, I would say 
definitely anything that's going to be exposed, you're going to want to protect it, right? Mm -hmm. You're also going to get sun through your windows of your car, right? So the windows will filter out your UVB, but they don't filter out the UVA. Anybody that wants to Google truck driver sun damage, it's pretty scary because there's a gentleman who's a truck driver who obviously never wore sunscreen. And the left side of his face is so much more sun damaged than the right side of his face. So people don't always think about that. I would also say it's important to remember to reapply your sunscreen because usually people put it on and then they forget about it. I will say Color Science has a fantastic powder sunscreen that's really nice, especially for women or golfers. Women like it because they can put it on even after they've done their makeup, and so they can do it throughout the day. And golfers like it because it doesn't make their hands greasy. Ah, So that's another really cool sunscreen. Okay. And I'm going to put all this in the show notes yeah, so that people will have this, yeah, this information. This is fabulous. So we talked a little bit about retinol or retinoids as being the R. Yeah. And so I love that. Is there a difference between retinol and a retinoid? Yeah, absolutely. So retinoids is kind of the family. So think of it as the umbrella. Retinoic acid or retin-A, a lot of people know about retin-A, is retinoic acid. When you get it at the pharmacy, it might say tretinoin, or you could get different over the counter now, which is adapalene. Those are retinoic acids. They're going to work a little bit faster and you'll get faster results, but they can be more drying. So a lot of times people will switch to a retinol as opposed to a retinoic acid, and those don't tend to work as fast, but they don't tend to be as drying. So as we get older, we get drier, and we might not be able to tolerate what we once were able to tolerate when we were younger. So we usually will have people who are a little bit drier start with a low retinol and then increase it. I don't want to say mistake, but sometimes people will start and they'll do it every day. You want to ease into a retinoid so that you allow your skin a chance to get used to it. And so I'll often tell people, start out Monday, Thursday. If you're doing okay and you're not flaky or red or peely, go ahead and go up to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you're doing okay with that a couple of weeks, then go up to every day. And you can actually increase the strength after you've done it a while. And sometimes you'll start someone at a retinol and then eventually move them to a retinoic acid. Just start slow. Okay. Yeah. And I would say this too, what retinoids do, they're really wonderful anti-aging because they help prevent the collagen breakdown that happens over time. And they also help stimulate cellular turnover. So you're getting rid of some of that older damaged skin. Okay. In regard to exfoliation, Mm -hmm. again, lots of information out there about skin damage from exfoliating. If you do get rough little patches and you just need to, what would you recommend? I always break it down into either chemical exfoliation or mechanical exfoliation. So what does that mean? Mechanical is when you have something that physically is exfoliating your skin, Mm -hmm. like one of those scrubby gloves that people use, or if you have little beads in a wash. So the one that when I was growing up was the St. Ives apricot scrub. (laughs) Oh my God, that yeah. stuff is like sandpaper. It is. And you don't <laughs> want to use that because the chunks are so irregular, they actually could damage your skin. But if you're looking for something that has little beads, you want to look for jojoba beads because they're small and round. So there's a lot of different cleansers out there that have jojoba beads. There's other things you can add. I don't have one that I specifically love. Well, I do have one, but I'll get to it in a second. Then you look at your chemical exfoliants. And what that means is you have something that's actually changing the chemical connection between the cells. So things like alpha hydroxy, beta hydroxy acids are chemical exfoliants. Mm -hmm. Salicylic acids are chemical exfoliants. Lactic acid is a chemical exfoliant. So those just, when you put them on, they actually help to break down the scaliness of your skin, but not because you're physically doing it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Right. Right. Skin Medica does have a really good combination cleanser. It's called Aha Baha, so alpha hydroxy, beta hydroxy, mm-hmm. and it also has the jojoba beads. And that's a really good mechanical and chemical exfoliant combined in one. Ooh, this is great advice. I'm loving this. Yeah, good. Right. Yes, yeah, so I will take lots of notes. The other one was vitamin C. 
that was the other question was I'm using vitamin C and I think it works, but I want to know why I'm using my vitamin C. (laughs) So vitamin C is an antioxidant. And when I think of antioxidants, people ask like, well, why should I use it? So your skin has antioxidants and the purpose of your antioxidants is actually to protect your skin from the environmental damage, right? Right. That's what we call extrinsic aging. All the things that are coming at you from the environment that are causing you to age and causing damage to your skin. So antioxidants help to protect your skin and prevent what's called free radical damage. So that's the damage kind of deep in the skin that can lead to skin cancers and aging over time. But not all antioxidants are created equally, Okay. right? So with a vitamin C, you really want to have the L-ascorbic acid and you want it to either be in an airtight chamber, okay? Or if it's not, it's going to oxidize. So SkinCeuticals has been around a long time. They're kind of were the leaders in vitamin C antioxidants way back when. If anyone's ever tried SkinCeuticals, you know that your battle starts a light, light color, and over time it turns brown, right? right. Well, it's oxidizing. Well, it is going to oxidize because it's not in an airtight chamber, but it's a good antioxidant. Mm-hmm. So you really want to make sure if you don't have an airtight chamber, if it's not turning a little brown, then why? Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you either want to have a vitamin C in an airtight chamber or you actually do kind of want it to oxidize a little bit. Okay. Now, vitamin Cs are not the only antioxidants out there, though. There's tons and tons of antioxidants. The percent of vitamin C in a vitamin C serum should be I'd what? say between 10 to 15%. Okay. Yeah, if that's what you're looking for. I also would say, though, that there are other antioxidants that also can help because they're all targeting different pathways. Skin Medica several years ago did actually come out with an antioxidant system. And I would say it's really the next generation in terms of antioxidant protection. They studied it in Shanghai and New Delhi because they're the two most polluted cities in the world. And they used it on people who work outside. And they had them use it every day. And they found that their free radical damage significantly decreased. That is a day and a night product. The day product protects your skin from things like ozone, UV, blue light, infrared, and the night product actually repairs the damage you did during the day, and it boosts your mitochondria's ability to kind of fix things. Very interesting. If you use your vitamin C, use it in the morning. I would say if you're going to use an antioxidant, I would do it in the morning. Okay. Hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. So hyaluronic acid is another building block in your skin. It's important in hydration. So hydration is your ability to retain moisture and water. As we get older, we lose our hyaluronic acid. That's one of the reasons as we get older, we start getting more dry. (laughs) Everything dries out. dries out, (laughs) right? Like I myself, I feel like everything, like my skin is more dry Mm -hmm. and we see it every day. Hyaluronic acid, it can be a really important step in your skincare routine. There's so many hyaluronic acids out there. My favorite hyaluronic acid is the HA5 by Skin Medica because it actually helps your skin build its own hydration. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I know we should drink water. Does drinking more water help any of these topicals work better? Honestly, I think we all should be drinking a lot of water. Our bodies are made up of so much water that any time you can drink more, I mean, not too much water, don't turn into a fish, but... No, I would agree. I think that we should all drink a lot of water. What other topicals? Did I miss any? So I would say one of my most important topicals, especially as we get older, would be a growth factor. So growth factors are cell signaling proteins in your skin, and they're really important at helping to delay aging and prevent what we call intrinsic aging. We talked about the extrinsic aging with your antioxidants, but we're going to get old right? I mean, it's just going to happen. Yeah. Are there things that we could do topically that could help delay that process? There's lots of different growth factors on the market. My favorite, if anybody ever listens to anything I say on Instagram, is the TNSA Plus. And I love that product because it is a combination of growth factors and antioxidants. So it's a really nice two-in-one product. 
In addition, they did studies looking at something called a senescent cell. When I read about the study, it was, I don't know, it kind of scared me because you have these cells in your skin. They're called senescent cells, kind of old cells. And I think of them like little people and they just sit in the corner and they don't do anything. They just take up space. But they're scary because they actually secrete an enzyme that turns other cells into old people. <laughs> they create what are called zombie <laughs> cells. No, it's really that, like terrifying. I, I, yeah, I know. And I think of them looking like little gremlins. I know. That's exactly how I think of them. I think of them like they're like sitting in a doctor's waiting room and they're just taking up space doing nothing. And I hate thinking of them that way. The studies that they did, they had people actually use the TNS and in 12 weeks, they did biopsies and they saw a significant reduction in those senescent cells. So I would say just over the last several years of having that product and using it, I feel like it really does help people's skin act younger. It helps them heal faster. Hmm. When we do procedures on people that have been using it, they tend to recover better. If there was one product other than a sunscreen that I'd say someone in their 40s plus would want to use, it would be the TNSA plus. All right. I'm, we need to talk after we're finished here. <laughs> no <laughs> senescent cells. I think of my face gremlins. That's all I'm going to think so about. Scary. I, it yeah. is scary. So let's talk about our morning routine. Yeah. What do we put on first? So I'd say always wash your face. Right? right? Obviously. <laughs> and then if you're going to do something like a growth factor, I would put that on first. In general, the rule of thumb is you want thinner before thicker, right? right. So look at the products that you have, but you also want to know the size of, I guess, the molecule in the product. So something like the growth factors, those you want to put on first because you want them to be able to get straight through into your skin. It really depends on what you're using. You might just have to look at what you have and say, okay, what order do we do that in? And we go over that all the time in our consults and say, okay, let's go over the order. I generally would end with a sunscreen just kind of on top, but it just depends on what you're using. In the morning, I would say wash your serum, your antioxidant, if it's not in your serum, your moisturizer, you know, depending on your moisturizer and your sunscreen. Obviously, there's other things we can talk about to address different things like, do you have rosacea? Do you have brown spots? What else are some of your concerns? At night, again, wash your face because it is important to get all your makeup off and you don't want to have your makeup sitting on your skin. Oh, no. And then again, I would do your growth factor. And then that's when you might use your retinoid, whether yeah. it's a retinol or a tretinoin. So you're going to want to use that one at night. Good. I'm doing it somewhat right. I do want to talk about aesthetic procedures. For this age group, we're starting to lose that elasticity in our face. Last night, one of my friends said, I'm getting jowly. I know there's been a lot of innovation in this part of your practice. What are people coming to you most often? What's their problem? So I, number one, people love Botox, but how do you not love Botox? It's fast. It works, and the only downside is it eventually wears off. Mm -hmm. But it helps with migraines, it helps with headaches, and it just makes you feel a little bit better about yourself. And when done correctly, in the right hands, people just look natural. I'd say a lot of people love Botox. We have people in their 20s who get Botox, people in their 80s who get Botox. It's a very safe treatment, and it's actually even being studied in things like depression. So it's a really interesting, interesting option. Otherwise, fillers have been around for a long time. When you look at different procedures, I always would start by saying, what's your concern and what do we need to address? And then understanding the aging face. And I could go on and on about the aging face, so I won't do that right now. <laughs> but we could go over different areas. I'd say people come in really to address things like volume loss and texture and brown spots fine lines and wrinkles, and then sagging. So when you say what's some of the more exciting things, I really love tightening procedures because I feel like it's something that you can do and it helps you long-term. And I call it putting money in your aging bank. So you're just kind of doing a procedure and it's helping to keep your skin a little bit tighter 
over time. And there's lots of different tightening procedures that are out there. I'd say as we get older, one of the biggest concerns that especially women have is kind of that jowling that they get and the loss of definition along their jawline, and then maybe more their loose neck. So you have to really understand why that's happening. If you think about it, as we get older, we start losing muscle, we start losing fat, we start losing collagen. And so the framework that your skin is on, you don't have that nice, strong framework anymore. So everything's going to just be a little bit looser and a little bit droopy. So we have to think about how do we rebuild that framework? So that's a lot of the time what we're doing is we're thinking, okay, how can we build, whether it's your muscle layer, how do we build your fat layer? How do we build your collagen layer? And how are we replacing that lost volume that you may have lost? Okay. And then, so what specific procedures are you talking about for those types of skin concerns? So I really like either radio frequency or ultrasound for helping to tighten the deeper layers of the skin. Those are great because they can be no downtime to minimal downtime and you just do it. And like I said, you just wait. They do take about three to four months for you to start seeing a difference. So you have to be patient. But again, it's not a race. Right. Sometimes it's okay to wait. Other times people want to see a result right away. And we all live in a world of instant gratification. Fillers are great because you do a filler and you see it right away and you're like, oh my gosh, that was money well spent. I feel so good. Fillers are going to last anywhere from eight to 18 months, depending on the filler and the placement of it. Otherwise, a lot of more people are doing threads. So threads are actually sutures that we slide under the skin and they help to lift the skin. Over time, they will eventually go away but they do create a collagen tract that also helps give a little bit of a longer term result. So explain that procedure a little bit. Right. So in general, most people will have threads placed. And if you could see the podcast and should just hear it, you could see it. But a lot of times we go along the jawline to pull the jawline back, or we go on the upper part of the cheek, kind of towards the nasal fold to pull that part back. Or you can go underneath the neck to pull kind of the neck back. And the entry points are in the, towards kind of the hairline area, so you don't see them as much. I would say it's not for someone who's never done a cosmetic procedure before. They're a little uncomfortable, but they really are almost no downtime because the only thing you see is a little entry point and that heals in a couple days. Okay. And you said how long do those last? So they last about eight to 12 months. Okay. But even patients that come back to have them done the following year still have better results than before they started. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. The topic last night came up about lip lines. Oh, yeah. Huge for women my age. And the big fear is I consider doing some fillers, but no one wants duck lips. If I would come home and my husband would say, what'd you do to your lips? Then we're going to have a problem. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and you know, honestly, especially in Cincinnati, Nobody wants to have big lips. If you went to California or maybe even Texas, people don't mind having that bigger lip. And especially in this city, people don't want to have that appearance. Things that you can do for lip lines. Number one, always start with your skincare. Number two, Botox actually in the upper lip, it's called the lip flip, can help soften those lines. The only downside is if you like to whistle or drink out of a straw, might not be able to do that, but it will help soften your lip lines and kind of lift that upper lip up a little bit. You could do any, again, of the tightening procedures, whether you do radio frequency or you do ultrasound, lasers are helpful. And then finally, you can do filler. Filler in the lip, if done well, sometimes you don't even notice it's been done. So it honestly is depends on who's doing it and how much they're putting in and do they know where to place it. The lip actually is an area that people don't realize as we get older, it elongates. That space between the bottom of your nose and the top of your lip, it actually gets longer and your lip starts turning in. So if you look at pictures over time, that's why people start looking more aged in that area. A lot of times when we treat lips, we put just a little bit of filler in the lip just so that it turns it back up. Oh, okay. You don't need a lot. I was poking around on Instagram. I'm not sure where I saw this, but someone 
showed a demonstration of someone with a gummy smile mm -hmm. where their gum was really pronounced. Yeah. And then I think they used Botox or something and it relaxed it enough and then they didn't have gummy smile. Anymore. Right. Oh, I didn't yeah. even know that was a thing. Oh, absolutely. So there's a muscle. If you put your finger right by the nostrils on either side, mm -hmm. right in that little muscle, you just put a dot and dot of Botox in there and that helps relax it and you can help the gummy smile. That is incredible. It's pretty cool. That's really I'm great. telling you, Botox is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and I think there's also that how much is enough and then when does Botox or Dysport or whatever you decide to use, mm -hmm. then when is it too much, right? And I think I've been doing Botox or now I do Dysport in my forehead. I've been doing that for 10 years. And I will say my mother would tell me for years and years and years, just even as a teenager, quit wrinkling your forehead, quit wrinkling your forehead. You're going to regret that later. And she was right, you know, and I just thought she was being an ag, but she was right. So I did eventually have to do it. And did you love it? Oh my God. It was like, sign me up. It exactly. was, you do it once and then there's no going back, but it's not just the wrinkles. And then this is what I try to tell people. I just look more awake. It's not really about looking younger as much as it is. I just look like I got a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. No one would look at me and think I had, you know. Well, and really it's because you have someone who's injecting you well. Yeah. Right. So people are afraid of an outcome that might not look natural, but really there are a lot of people who have, whether it's Botox or filler that are done well, and you don't even know. Right. Like I would look at you and I would never be like, oh, my gosh, she's overdone. She has too much. I think you look great. Well, thank you. You look natural and it looks like your face. But I think that the fear is, is it going to be me or am I going to look fake? And honestly, that's in the hand of the injector. So I think it's really important, frankly, in a world where we have so many people injecting and you could go down the street and another place like pops up. Well, just because they can inject, are they really the best person to inject? Right. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So I always say make sure that who you're injecting understands what they're doing. They understand the anatomy of the face. And they also, frankly, can address a complication. Okay. I think that's really important. The other thing is it's okay to do the minimum go slow, right? And then you can always go back in a couple mm -hmm. weeks and say, okay, this isn't quite what I was thinking, you know? Right. And so I think there's always that option too. And that's why I try to tell people, don't be afraid because it's not. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because a lot of times that what I tell patients, especially when they're coming in the first time, I say, listen, let's do a little bit. I want you to come back in two weeks. I can always add more, mm -hmm. but I can't really take it away. So let's just see what you think. And I don't always start with every area, right? I kind of listen to what their concerns are. We do that and we see. And a lot of times patients will come back and be like, I really like that. All right, I want to try this now. So I think that whoever you see, you just have to have a level of trust with them. And it has to be a partnership because you do have to have an understanding of, okay, this is what I want. This is what you can do. Let's figure out what the best plan is. This is a great segue because I think this is a great way to wrap it up. Just so our listeners know, Dr. Foad and I spoke before we started recording and decided that we would have to split this into two shows. There's so much to talk about the face and aesthetics. Then we thought, oh my gosh, then there's the whole body procedures piece that we didn't even get to touch on and we're almost at 40 minutes. So we decided we're going to do round two. And we will talk all about body. We'll talk about fat reduction, cellulite, even vaginal rejuvenation, which I think is really fascinating. We can dive into that as well. So. Yeah. One of my favorite procedures, because so many women, especially as we get older, we don't talk about it. It's so important. It it's really so important. is. One of my mantras is please don't suffer in silence. If it's bothering you, talk to somebody because there's probably a solution for you out there. 
Oh, uh, well, this has been so great. I know. Thank you so much. I just love talking to you. And anytime we can do more, just let me know. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks. Follow Asking for a Friend on social media outlets and provide a review and share this show wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews and sharing help us grow. 